Hello and welcome to That's Not Spit, It's Condensation. I'm Ryan Beach, and today I am joined by Scott Belk. He teaches trumpet at the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music. Uh, Scott and I have already done a podcast episode uh, a while back, I'm pretty sure. I, I forget how far ago it was, but that was, for me, a really wonderful conversation because Scott is very organized in his practice, uh, maybe a little bit differently than me, so it was cool to learn uh, how his approach to uh, having structure in his practice would allow him to track progress over time. We're going to kind of dive into that today in a little bit different way. And um, we're just going to see kind of what else I can learn from him. So before we get started, I just want to say thank you so much for giving me some of your time and diving deep with me today. No, oh, thanks, Ryan. It's it's great talking with you. We had a great time last time, and I'm 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 already kind of I I'm geeked about talking about practicing. <laughs> uh, I wasn't always this way, but I you know I I, I came to it a little later, but I, I dig it. You know. Yeah, me too. I, and and the whole coming to it later as well. I, feel like I just kind of did whatever before, and now I, I'm much more thoughtful. So it's nice to be able to talk to you as well. Um, to get started, uh, just for everybody so we're all on the same page, the goal of this is to kind of dive into and develop and maybe even kind of process a practice system, a way that Scott would make decisions in his practice sessions, why he would make some of those decisions to see if we can learn from that. So, uh, Scott, you pick up a piece of music for the first time, and you've never seen it before, and you want to get the most out of your work. What would you do first? Well, uh, I, first of all, I love the premise, the idea of like uh, of of what what are the priorities and what's the, maybe the short and long term goals of of what uh, practice might look like. Um, I would kind of come back and and say I would need probably some more parameters for the. Uh, the situation of the music, um, because I, I, cause I, I thought a lot about this after after you kind of prompted me with it, and um, there's sort of a continuum of you know the music that you might be preparing, and there's music that you uh, there's purpose of behind the music, and there are a lot of different obviously a lot of different settings that you might be uh, and conditions that you might be performing under. So I guess I would start with sort of like the short term uh, setting, where it's like say a, a studio session. I sit down, um, I'm with a group of people, I have never seen the music before, and we have to get a take of it in the next, you know, 10 to 15 minutes. So I've done uh, a, a fair amount of that type of, of uh, practice or uh, preparation, where the moment that you see it, you're, you're on a ticking to uh, clock, and you have, you have a very short period of time to, to uh, get ready to play, to do a take. Um, and you're getting paid for this. So time is of the essence and the people that are around you are also getting paid. So, you know, errors are, are, uh, uh, you know, are to be avoided at, at, as, as much as possible. It doesn't mean you're necessarily going to play perfectly. Um, so when I have done uh, like sort of a national national sessions where you literally open up the envelope and you sit down, you might have a couple of minutes to noodle through something. Uh, before, uh, while they're, they're getting mic levels or they're uh, they're doing things in the studio, um, what I would do is I do the basic roadmap of the of the piece that you're going to do when you're sight reading, sort of have a checklist where you're going through uh, the the literal roadmap of the uh, the form of the tune, any kind of key changes, meter changes, tempo changes, things that are structurally going to really draw attention to themselves if you miss something so if you if you miss a key change on a you know and uh, everything goes up a half step and you miss a, a sharper flat that, that'll crash a take or it can, it can bleed into somebody else's microphone so those are high priority things that you're going to look at and you're going to uh you know you're going to make sure that you don't step in those kind of cracks the next thing i'm going to do is i'm going to look at things that look difficult that look uh, awkward or uh, uh, things I know on site are going to give me the most challenge uh, to uh, execute immediately. Sometimes it might be something like uh, uh, a, a long passage where you've got a kind of a, a, a jazz melody that's with the saxophone, so I guess solely, that is lots of writing going on and there's, there, you have to negotiate lines. Sometimes it might be uh, lead types of things that are up in the upper register and you want to make sure you might have a minute to kind of uh, you know, I kind of pick those off, uh, in the, in the room. And, and, and so the, the at least the, the type of sessions that I've been on aren't so high leverage that I haven't been able to kind of at least kind of work through things 
on my own in a couple of minutes or a couple of seconds, you know, prior to a take. So that's just survival practice. That's just get the things under your fingers as well as you can in a short period of time. And, um, and the type of practice you're doing is musical practicing. You have to, you already hopefully have developed a skill set that you can execute this. Just you have to become familiar, as familiar with whatever you're about to play as possible in the shortest period of time. And uh, I find this kind of playing to be very, uh, it's very rewarding when you've done it, but it's also very stressful. So it's not for everybody. And it's, uh, it's not something I necessarily look forward to doing uh, at this point in my life because I find it stressful. Uh, I've always gotten called back from the sessions that I've done and rehired. But uh, it, it, uh, what you're trying to do is, is play cleanly, mainly. Uh, at least at, at, at the level that I've been at. So you're not, you're not trying to do some major interpretation. You, you're, they hired you because you sound like you or you, you can sound like what they want. And you don't, so there's not a whole lot of like artistic involvement. You play the style of the piece. These are things that you've done for years, hopefully. And, uh, and you've informed your ears. So if it says you're doing something in a traditional New Orleans style, or you're doing something in a classical style or a, a dance or whatever, you've, you've already informed all that. So the practice for that is already a lot. The preparation for that is all, is all done. So it's just really short term. At the, at the other end of that spectrum, so like I said, this is immediate. I have to practice it now. I got to get my fingers under it. And like I said, I will go through it quickly if there's a long run something that's that's and i will analyze the, the theory of it look what scale it is what the if it's not a scale i will look at um i'll break it down and say this is a uh you know the first part of it maybe is in this key the second part of it is in that key i'll try to get patterns that i don't have to read note to note so my theory is my theory knowledge is pretty pretty good so i can i'm looking for musical patterns that are recognizable for larger chunks of the music so i can think in those terms as opposed to having to read individual pitches and you know bang 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 a sequence of notes you know 16th notes is very difficult if you don't see the overlying structure that it happens to be diminished uh scale but it just happens to have a chromatic passing tones here or that here or there you know so so for for things that are moving around a lot i use as much theory knowledge as i can to to be able to let my my eyes rest for a moment in terms of trying to ha- pick out individual pitch types of things. I think that's important. Um, Do you mind if I ask you a question sure, about yeah, that? I promise yeah. I won't let you forget the other oh, no. end of the contempt. I'm going to write this down. down. Yeah. The other end, I won't let you forget. But So it sounds like for this style of learning music very quickly, it's not necessarily what I had in mind because my yeah. classical background, I'm thinking about you pick up the Jolove or the Tomasi for the first time. What's that process? But I, lo- I, I want to dig into this a little bit because what you're talking about has a lot of carry over to other types of gigs or what I do with the orchestra. It's a fair amount of I'm pull, I'm learning lots of music. And while I can spend some time with it, if you had to sit down and learn every measure of every piece over the course of a season, that would be in, that was be such a time commitment yeah. that it's not really feasible. And so what you alluded to having that skill set developed is really where uh, a lot of that success is found, in my opinion. And so if we could dig into this for just a second, um, what it sounds like from what you're saying to me, and I I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that almost things like theory and spending time like away from the instrument and learning about these basic t- things of theory. Like when I was in theory, it was just kind of a thing I had to do. Right. Yep. And maybe yep. I cared about it, but maybe I didn't, but especially for what you're talking about, learning things really quickly, spending time with theory, developing that into that picture in your head. So instead of learning individual notes, you can see patterns. There's a pretty essential part of the, someone's development would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. You know, and and same deal. When I took theory class uh, my freshman year, and and when I went to grad school because I, I had to take the refresher classes because I didn't get th- I didn't get through the the, the uh, test like three different times. Um, so uh, I didn't realize that a lot of a lot the, the, the a lot of times the missing ingredient now that I teach college is the synthesis that that doesn't happen uh, amongst the the, the subject matter uh, that you're you're studying so we understand that we we have to th- study theory but we don't really 
see the applications or it's, it's not, it's, we're not led to that by our instructors at the university or, you know, and sometimes some, some, if you've got a good one, you, you know, they'll, they'll point in the right direction. But uh, the, the job of the student is to take the information and try to frame and find perspective of why, how you're going to a- apply it and why it's important because it's obviously important enough for generations and generations of people to study theory. And, uh, but you know, is it no different for you because you, you know, you you're not going to be a classical player. You're going to be a commercial player. You're going to be a jazz player. And, um, so understanding greater patterns, I mean, you know, one way to think of theory is to think of it as a, uh, as almost like a filing, a labeling system for a filing system of, of sound. So, so we just have access to a way of quickly, like random access, you know, like the RAM of the computer where you can, you can get to sound very quickly because you understand what it is or what it's supposed to sound like. And so we're just trying to order things and and make connections across the disciplines. So, um, but the, the, um, the idea of theory is is that um, one of the, one of the things that I, I like to think about when we think about patterns and and greater patterns of keys and chords and 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 so forth is like uh, processing your information quickly. Uh, chess masters, um, they did. I, I don't know if you ever saw this. They did a study with with chess masters who were able to. Uh, there was one that was he was playing fifty simultaneous games blindfolded are you familiar with that and yeah, uh, yeah. one one 47 of them and drew, drew the other three and and uh and then they also did a study with patterns with uh average people where they would just put the uh you know they would look have them look at a chessboard for 10 seconds or and then ask them to recall the, the positions of the chess pieces and the average person could in that amount of time whatever it was was able to recall you know three or four or five pieces um but a chess master could memorize the entire board in 10 seconds and so they thought well of course you're a chess master you should be able to memorize the board because you know and so but that what they did was uh in in the study i wish i could remember what it was i read about it years ago was they they randomized all the positions they just took the white and the black and they just put them anywhere where they couldn't be actually in an actual game so the right the whites were on the black and the black Mm -hmm. you know and 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 uh, then they found that the chess master's recollection of, of positions was about the same as an average person. Yeah. So, so the your ability to move, you know, to to larger patterns allow you to just basically chunk theory, where you're learning chunks as opposed to individual small pieces, and that's much quicker. It's a much much faster way to access information, and so it's 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 like super helpful. I don't have to think about a sextuplet if I know it's just an A flat major scale from starting on F. Or, yeah, gee, you're right. You know, so it's bang. I don't have to read the notes anymore. I just know what it is. Identify it as a thing. Yeah, a lot so, of students, I think, struggle. One of the things I hear they struggle with is sight reading. And mm-hmm. I mean, you could practice sight reading as, a, and I think it's necessary to do that. But I think this is one of the, like you said, one of the missing components of getting better at sight mm-hmm. reading is just developing and making your understanding more complex. And if sure. you even uh-huh. wanted to. Break it down even more basic. But I feel like one of the things I've come to, and this is why I'm having these conversations, is I think the understanding or what you call the synthesis is sort of an underrated part of of just people understanding what makes somebody a professional or able to play at a high level. It's not just that they've developed good technical skills or reliable technical skills, but they're the depth of understanding of how music fits together and what styles are which. And I think some people naturally come to that because they grew up listening to music or their teachers, you know, required them to study. But sometimes it can feel maybe like a chore, right? When you do it as like, I got to learn this style. I had a mm-hmm. conversation with Pete Bond about this. So I'm kind of curious what your take is on how you maybe in terms of style, because you mentioned that earlier, knowing styles is important. What's your take on the effect, like an effective way? Obviously, listening is probably going to be the answer, but how do you make it so it's not so much of a, a of a chore to learn these styles, but rather it's just part of how you go about doing things because you understand the importance of developing this understanding? Right. Does that question make sense? Yeah, it, it does. I mean, the the frame of mind 
that you have, especially like in a lot of what we do in, in, at the university is, is almost industrial. I mean, it's, it's corporate teaching that's done for large, large groups of people, uh, that, that has to be fairly uniform to, to, to have like to be have uh, the, the outcomes that are sort of documentable and and uh so there there tends to be a sort of a homogenous a- approach and then when you have that you really end up having something that can be a pretty sterile environment it can feel every class is going to be a lecture someone's standing at the front of the room kind of throwing information at you and everybody knows that that doesn't matter what the information is that at a certain point you're just sort of going to you know uh kind of nod off because of that sort of format of learning. Um, taking an active part in, in your own learning and your own, um, in your own growth is, is something that happens outside of school. And so when you look at your skill set, one of the things I, I taught a class on, it was, call, it was called uh, the academic job search, and it was about learning uh, how to approach getting a job in higher education. All right. So the, the, the application process, putting together your documents, interviewing, all the kind of components that go into the search process and, and uh, putting together a, 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 a teaching philosophy, all of these uh, aspects and then preparing your, your CV. But one of the things I came to with this class was, is that you think of a CV or your resume, the things that are on your resume. Most people were, were getting a little bit off the subject, but it's, sure. it's, it's germane. Because they're they're active active CVs that that um, uh, your the CV is a document of your skills and experience. So your skills and experience you can look at it in you know r- what's written down at least to a degree, and so you can from that document. A lot of people think, well, every time I got I do something, I just need to write it down, which is true. And, um, and, and they look at it as a passive thing. It's like, like a record of where you're just kind of feeding your experiences. But if you look at it from the other standpoint where it's actually a living document that you can look at and say, well, you know, I don't have these experiences that people who are getting hired do. All right. Well, no one's calling me for those because I'm, I'm at the beginning of my career or they think of me in other ways or I'm pigeonholed in this particular community for in this way. And so so what you have to do or what you can do, what I sort of did naturally or what some people do naturally, is you look at your CV, you look at your skill set, you look at your experiences, and you, and you honestly have to uh, evaluate what needs to be strengthened, what's weak, what areas are weak, what areas are strong that can also be strengthened. And then you can identify ways of creative ways of, you know, sort of like attacking those, those, those deficits or those areas that need to be improved. So rather than being passive and saying, well, I don't have uh, chamber music experience. Nobody calls me for that because I'm new in town. Well, you can just sit in your apartment and wait for the call, or you can put together a reading session, put together a brass quintet, you put together a chamber ensemble, you, you, you call people that are like-minded or, you know, that are hopefully even better than you and say, Hey, you want to read some charts? Then you have to get charts together. So you absolutely, what, what you're doing is taking an active part in your development. And I think, I think exactly what you're talking about is, is that people are waiting to be told what to do and people are, are it's not going to be very, you know, it's not going to happen. You have to figure it out. You have to figure out the things that you need to be better at. You need to seek out really, really strong uh, and s- specific feedback from people that you trust. You have to be ready to discard that. You have to be ready to trust it completely and see where it gets you. Um, and um, you have to to look at your realistic goals in terms of, I mean, we're talking about artistic goals, career goals, audition goals, repertoire goals. There are all these different types of things that you have to actively, you're responsible for it. No one's going to do it. And so one of the things that we see, we talk about like on the internet, we're we're like-minded in the, in the fact that we're sort of seeking um, in a way, we're seeking a way of, of getting better at what we do, thinking of, of refined ways of thinking of it, uh, streamlined way methods that will help us. So, like the number, the two people that are going to get the most out of our conversation are you and me, right? Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and if somebody else gets some great, but we're out here going, ha, huh, I want to find out more about that. <laughs> right, right. 
you know, and and so that's where a lot of people are are you know they're they're passive. So so when you're looking at and this is something I'm going to be writing about in in my own writings is like so we get on the internet and we see a, a five minute trumpet blog or a hack or you know the secret to this or a tip or a, a trick or whatever like that is what you're getting a lot of times what that the the, the bargain is with that is it, it's received wisdom it's wisdom that somebody else is already i'm 57 and i'm going to sit here i'm going to tell you how to practice um but really the way to practice is to really just throw hours at it <laughs> and throw as many hours at it and and just figure out how to get better at it but if you don't throw those minimum amount of hours at it, you're not going to get better at it. I mean, so, so, and minimum is going to be, there's never enough, you know, at, <laughs> at first, you know, for, for most of us, some people yeah. like, you know, they, 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 they work really quickly. I'm a super slow learner. And so I just, I finally came to grips with that. And then I realized, oh, it's going to take me a lot longer than I would like. And that's okay too. So that gets me back. Actually, I kind of, I'm kind of coming back to where, where I started with this, with the, the idea of the timeline of the repertoire that you're, you're, you're working on. So we've got that immediate stuff. I got, I got three and a half minutes before we're going to do the read through for, for style. And then we're going to do a take. Okay. And then we've got the other, uh, the other end of it, which is there's a repertoire for a lifetime. And, and that repertoire for a lifetime is something that's really sorely missing, especially in the trumpet community. Um, you know, if you play piano, my sons both play piano and they both play trumpet, but they don't, they don't dig it like piano. And, uh, but when they, when they play the piano, they're playing pieces where they're playing Brahms and Liszt and, or, uh, Chopin and, and they're going to play and, and Scott Joplin and they're gonna play this for the rest of their lives. Mm-hmm. You know? So when you yeah. sit down to play a, a Chopin prelude or, or, or nocturne, it's, it's something beautiful that you're going to, you're going to have to, to enjoy and work on and you're never going to never going to not play that. Maybe it's going to be a couple of years or 10 years and you haven't played it and you pick it up and go, Oh, I love this piece. But that's not how we work as trumpet players. We tend to be playing a part of something, but we're not playing the whole thing or that's what it feels like a lot of time. So, so I think when we do that, we're playing excerpts or we're playing, you know, uh, audition pieces that are never the whole piece, or we're playing one movement on a, on a, on a, a split recital, or we might play an entire concerto, but how often does that really happen? How often do you, I mean, you, you, I come at this actually, even though I'm, is that me b- uh, dinging? Is it, can you hear that? Okay. I think I, it's my email. I don't know. It sounds fun. I'm hearing something anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, my, my degrees are actually in classical, uh, trumpet. Oh, okay. so I come out of the, my, my doctorate's in, in classical trumpet from the Cincinnati uh, College Conservatory of Music. And so I had that discipline of the classical approach to practicing stamp and chickowitz and all the different things. My my first main teacher when I was in high school was literally moved from uh, uh, Northwestern to my hometown and started teaching at the local university. He had been studying with chickowitz And that, that stuff got dumped into my bloodstream in when I was a junior in, in, uh, in high school. So, uh, but the, the, the idea of what we're playing is it's so compartmentalized. So when we break things down, we, when we practice and it's a good thing, it's a necessary thing to break things down into the small bits that we need to figure out how to play. But I think one of the big missing ingredients is, is being able to approach, like say, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I was on the audition interview circuit for university jobs for years literally and um i used to approach it like um i've got to get ready for this you know i'm I'm going to get ready for this uh interview um i got so busy as a professional playing shows freelance and doing a lot of other stuff that i couldn't think like that i had to work in my practice in between you know shows or in between when my kid was born things got pretty busy so um I gravitated from sitting down with dedicated practice sessions where I was going to hash everything down into the smallest bit. And then I, I began to practice. I was doing for my auditions when I would go into a, uh, into an interview, I was doing a uh, Haydn first movement. I was doing Telemann. Um, I can't remember which, uh, and then I was doing the uh, Inesco legend and something else. And a couple of jazz tunes. These were for classical uh, positions. Um, instead of sitting in a room with a 
music stand in front of me, I started to play the Haydn like it was a jazz tune. Mm. So basically, I would not, I would just walk around my living room and I would not look at the piece. I wasn't staring at a piece of music trying to internalize a written piece of music. I started to practice it like it was a tune. And when I got to a place that was rocky, I would just kind of go over it and try to make it right. But I wasn't doing it. I just do, I was doing it much more organically than I had before. I'm, I'm organized. But where I really started to get consistent was when I was able to play an entire movement. from, And I was playing it by, I think it's important to, for me, it really helped. I played it by ear. I didn't, I wasn't playing it from memory. I wasn't trying to memorize it. I was trying to just play the song as my ear heard it. So when I gave that up, instead of trying to play it perfectly, or I got to play this phrase perfectly 10 times with the coins, I move them across the desk and then I move them back. And I, you know, all these sort of like, like these, these games that you play with yourself to try to play accurately. I I'd stopped doing that. And I just started playing the song. I played the song of Haydn first movement. Okay. And I just did it a lot. I just did it a lot. And my learning speed for that really sped up because I wasn't so down. I was learning large chunks. I was playing long phrases. I was playing things. And what ended up happening was, is after I had been doing that for a while, I was doing a Broadway show. I was doing two Broadway shows back to back. I was doing Hairspray and um, maybe it was Wicked or Legally Blonde. I can't remember. Uh, no, it was, it was Hairspray in two different cities. That's right. And so two really short runs, one in Dayton and one in Columbus. And then in between each of those, I was doing playing lead with and playing lead with the Columbus Jazz Orchestra. So I had like six weeks in a row where I had like three <laughs> days three days off. And then I had a college audition. They flew me on President's Day on my on my day off. And then I I had to play a Haydn Telemon legend and, and everything else. Um so I remember opening up the Haydn in front of me for my recital at the it was at Washburn University. And I remember thinking, oh, I haven't seen this music in a while. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then, but I played the entire movement in the cadenza, and I didn't miss anything. And so it wasn't, and I'm not like like some super clean, like studio level, like never miss guy. I'm not that guy. Um, I just sort of could do it, if, if that makes sense. Sure, yeah. So I just played the movement. I was like, well, okay, I guess I can do that now. But I I was doing it in a more organic way as opposed to sitting there like, okay, I've got to check 50,000 boxes to get to the end of this movement. It's like, I, I was like, oh, I can play all this. It's It just re- kind of reminded me where I was, but I wasn't looking at it and trying to read it, yeah. if that makes sense. It does. I'm gonna, so, yeah. Sorry, I'm going to yeah. do my yeah, best. Yeah. I, I You've said a whole bunch of things that are really <laughs> cool to me, and I just want to try to summarize a little bit of sure. it for, for, for myself, but also making sure that yeah. I uh, understand, but anyone listening, one thing I liked about what you said was, like what you talked about playing by ear versus memorization. It just sounds like you're sort of looking at practice as the gradual process of internalizing something so that it's like a part of you. And I've interviewed, um, you know, violin soloists. This is what they do. And she was playing the Tchaikovsky. Her name is Tessa Lark. And she was playing the Tchaikovsky that week. And she spoke about it very similarly, where it's almost like it's become a part of her. And when you're talking, what I feel like if I were to try to summarize it, I would. You're almost describing practice as the process of gradually achieving more and more freedom, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It, instead yeah. of it becoming, you're putting yourself in this box. It's rather you're gradually learning to let go of the technical aspects because they're all there. Mm-hmm. Your fundamentals certainly, how strong your fundamentals are, certainly contribute to that. But you say, well, some technical passages. I'm just working through that. I want to dive into that in a second. Yeah. But it almost sounds like, yeah, you're using this process of practicing to gain freedom of from the page, freedom of expression. And so almost if you want to say that that would be your litmus test or your goal of asking, was I successful in my preparation is, did I achieve that feeling of freedom in my music making? Would you say that's accurate? Yeah. And, and so like if, if you're thinking in terms of an audition or a recital or a performance, the you know, the people that really do well in those situations, in my opinion, in my observation is are people that just do a lot of it. 
Right. And, and I think one thing that's very difficult for people who are in, if someone's taking the time to watch this, you know, they're, they're, they probably don't perform as much as much. They, so, so like if you're going to play Hummel or Haydn, how often do you actually do that in front of people? Not very often. So when, what ends up happening is, is when you're playing, playing that piece, it's an event. Yeah. All right. So if you think I'd, I'd like to, I'd, I'd rather it be like a family folk band just playing for at a picnic you know, where it's like, this is what we do every weekend, right? It's like, they don't get nervous about that. They just, just, just sort of do it. And, you know, and, and so the, and I'm not saying you would get nervous, but if it's something that you do versus a big event that you're preparing for, that's a whole, that's a whole different universe. So the repetitions, where you get into repetition, that's another thing that's really super important about what the rep, meaningful repeti- rep, repetitions are, are those reps that are going to allow you not only to execute or play whatever it is that you're trying to play, but, and, and this is where uh, I think I might've talked, I think maybe when we talked, I was already doing my Donna Lee project. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm still doing that. But the, <laughs> by the way, I'm like two and a half years into yeah. it, but, <laughs> but the, but the idea behind the, the, I think what a lot of people do when they, when they're, when they're practicing is they're trying, like I used to practice lots of repetitions, with the idea that if I do this enough, I won't miss. Mm. I'll do it so much this way that I can't miss it. And it was like, that was sort of like really, really brute force. And it didn't work very well. Um, it, it had a moderate amount of success just from the repetitions. But but I was reinforcing ways of playing that maybe through repetition that weren't so great. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so that the, the, the repetitions are going to free up two different things. They're going to free up your body. In other words, that when you do... When you're playing something that's demanding, it's not you're not working at a, a high percentage of your capacity, technically or physically. So it's not it's not something that's going to require perfect execution. It's something that can actually require most of you know you're just the way you execute, if that makes sense. So so that you you're not you don't have like this now at the highest possible. If I'm auditioning for the New York Philharmonic or Chicago Symphony, you know this is not this is not the case. This is there's such detail work that goes into what's happening with the the degree of 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 fine detail and phrasing and things that are that are happening. But for most of us, ninety nine percent of us, we're just trying to play something that 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 sounds good that 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 is clean you know that 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 is accurate that that's musical and those parameters are much more achievable and uh most people can do it but they're trying to do something maybe even harder than what they realize they're attempting something they're attempting to do something at a level that's beyond what they actually need to do yeah and um so but you also, I, part of the thing that's really helped me the last, maybe since pandemic and everything, is 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 thinking in terms of mental ease. In other words, we're kind of taught that you need to have, you need to be in the moment, you need to be a hundred percent focused at all times, and you need, you know. And I've never been. I mean, I'm not saying I've never been a hundred percent focused, but you know, how long can you really stay a hundred percent focused? Someone walks into the room, a baby starts crying. You know, there's a, you, you kick a mute. There's there's always going to be things that that draw a portion of your attention in in the course of a, of a uh, a live performance, whether it's an audition or so. The, the question is, can you still operate at a high level without a hundred percent of your focus? So it doesn't require my entire being to be a hundred percent in each phrase where I can kind of just, if I know the tune, I'll, I'll give you an example. I play here in Cincinnati with a wonderful guitar player. Uh, his name is Ted Karras and he's a, uh, he's got a, uh, He's a great jazz and fusion player, but he's also a great pop player. And he's got a wedding band that's been going for 30 some years. And he can shred. I mean, he just sits there and shreds on this on this wedding. And I haven't played with him in years, but but you'll see him on a gig at a wedding, at this high dollar wedding in, you know, one of these nice venues in, in one of the hotels. And he'll be shredding a solo and talking to the bride's mother <laughs> at the same time. All right. Because he's like, okay, yeah, well, after this, we can just, we can bring the wedding party up. And, you know, and and you're sitting across the stage going, it's all I can do to play, you know, September or whatever it is that we're doing, you know, and and, and he's over there like just playing in solo, playing some intricate part, which means that he's got so much sort of like reserve 
of attention and you know just under his fingers that he's able it doesn't require a thousand percent of your focus and that realizing that that's where the repetitions are going to get you to where i don't need one thousand percent focus i can sort of like be in the moment i can kind of enjoy i can like oh you know i can on the rest i can look out and say hey mom there's mom you know or whatever and just be like hey we're making music as opposed to this is a super important every, everything about it is dripping with gravity and everything is dripping with mm. with uh, seriousness and it's like okay well i mean and there is pressure and and you know i've i've played with orchestras and played lead with you know indianapolis and cincinnati and recording and stuff like that and i'm not saying you're going to feel that way during those gigs but ideally most of what i want my experience to be is more like that where the things that i'm doing are you know uh, enjoyable and they don't require me to be just just up to here with the music yeah so the, so it's such an interesting difference for me because like my Sorry, job, I'm <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> I'm out on the back porch. I screened in, but there's a, a midgy that's made its way in. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's an interesting difference because in my job, sort of like, I don't want to call it perfection of execution, but that's probably the best way to say it. It's sort of a goal. Right. And so I think for me, I've, I've been at the reason I'm asking these questions is I've been I've been sort of headed in this direction myself, trying to wonder how do I get closer and closer to technical perfection, not because I think it's necessary, but just as a goal, right? As a goal Mm -hmm. of like, how do I move closer? And I have found personally that my level of focus is directly related to how well I do or don't play. And so for me, I, I actually agree with you. Like there's layer, I can, I can, I don't, it doesn't take everything I have, but I notice if I let it slips a little bit too much, that's where I start making mistakes that I wouldn't normally make if I was sure. more engaged. Yeah. And so I also find a, a, a layer of nuances. I don't necessarily think I have to be focused 100% of the time, but knowing how to get back to that deep level of focus is actually something worth spending time developing, personally, I think. And But I just I just really enjoy what you're saying because you want to be able to like actually enjoy it shouldn't be this insanely stressful thing to just play basic music. Like you'll have your five percent of music that's stressful or five percent of opportunities that are like, okay, this is crazy, like I'm I'm in it. But to have developed such skill in your fundamentals and in the new music theory and things like that, where you have a level of confidence coming in, I think is is sort of the goal. Um, I would like to try, so I just, I love what you're saying. And I think it's slightly different than the premise of the episode, which is what you said in the very beginning. (laughs) So I think I know how to frame it for you in a way that would, that would get after kind of a little bit into the practice theory is I know nothing or very little about jazz standards. I've certainly listened to some of the greats, but not nearly as much as I probably should if that was a desire of mine. So let's say you were my teacher and you assigned me something like Autumn Leaves or Four. I only know like the very, very, very basic standards or Donna Lee or something. Um, How would you go about structuring my ability to use the that standard and the, you know, the working on that standard to just develop the skills that I want to develop. Does that, does that difference? Like you're sure. talking about, I have these skills. Here's how I would go about working through it. What about when right. you want to use a standard to develop those skills themselves? Sure. Well, and that's a, that's a great question. It's what we kind of do in a, in our jazz program. Most jazz programs are repertoire based. So, um, which is also, I mean, it's the same premise. You, you mm-hmm. can, you can say, I, I've got these skills. I'm going to attack the repertoire or you can take the repertoire and say, I'm going to use it to teach me to be a better musician or to, to, to create a, a template for learning. So, um, the type of thing that we're going to do in, a, in our lessons is if you were one of my students here, um, is that we would do some transcription and, and transcription is sort of a long word. Again, it's, 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 it's an it's a word that obscures really what you're doing because it sounds like somebody that's a court reporter or it's somebody that's doing a non fun thing. Um, you just play along with somebody you're playing. So you so we'll take for instance uh, first semester we might listen to Autumn Leaves. We'll listen to Chet Baker play Autumn Leaves. We'll listen to Miles Davis play Autumn Leaves, um, and we'll learn the melody by playing along by ear with uh, with Autumn Leaves. Um, we'll also try to take off some of the 
uh, the harmony um, and create our own chord sheet. Um, we're also at some point going to try to uh, look at a, a good lead sheet that will give us um, some direction in terms of what, what other people, what the rhythm section might be actually mm. thinking or, or playing at that, at, at this moment. And then we're going to go through and we're going to look at um, the first, you know, the process being is fairly standardized throughout, you know, sort of jazz teaching um, for better or for worse. But we're going to learn the melody along, you know, and, and sort of like basically you practice channeling or mimicking or, or um, you know, uh, just copy the masters. Yeah, copying the masters. So and then maybe we'll listen to other I've got I put together folders of tune. So let's say the tune would be autumn leaves, but I might have 10 different versions. Um, now, my wife is uh, a friend. Uh, uh, orchestral French horn player. And I know that when she was, you know, she played many years up in Dayton here, the in Dayton Philharmonic um, on second horn, and then was, you know, subbed with Cincinnati a lot and the pops and ballet and everything. When she knew she was going to be playing Bruckner seven, she went out and got as many copies of recordings of Bruckner seven to, to inform possible tempo, possible uh, interpretation style. How does Cleveland do it? How does Nashville do it? That's the one that happened to be in, in the public library, you know, not because she went looking for Nashville. It was just happened to be one of them. What's, uh, what is the, uh, you know, New York Philharmonic, how do they go about it so that you have some choices? Um, and that's a great way to think of it. So even if you're, it, it's all transferable, by the way, it has nothing to do with the fact that it's jazz. Um, one thing I did with my classical students, my last two jobs were, um, classical uh, trumpet jobs, but, would listen to i took the uh identifying information off uh i think eight Haydn expositions i made mp3s i cut them i edited them out and i said you know one of them was allison balsam one was reinhold friedrich one was uh crispin steel perkins one was uh maurice andre one was timothy dark Schitzer. and i took all the uh, information off and i just said eight you know number one two three four and five which ones do you like Mm -hmm. you know and i know i created a template in, in sibelius with with no marking so i just had the notes of the fr just the first page of the haydn and i said put in the articulations that you're hearing in the one that you like because you're going to have eight different articulations slurs and tongues and shorts and longs and this is similar in jazz it's not it's learning music from uh listening to great reference you know references and uh, masters so we would do that we would then we would actually that would be by ear learning the solo there would be nothing written down once you can play the solo and the melody without um without looking at anything then you start the process of writing things down um then you include the chord changes and then we do analysis and we look at we look at the the solos and we break them down and we find things that are considered language um things that are uh common or common types of, um, they may be patterns or melodic phrases or cliches or quotes or things, and start to see, get under the hood and see. Uh, I, I heard it described as, as sort of a three step process identification, that's cool. You know, <laughs> uh, what is it? And then figuring out how to do it in context. So you take some of that material you practice it in a rep repetitious way with a track or with just you know, with a metronome and different tempos and different keys. And then you practice using some of that language in, um, in the same tune at, at, at first, that's not a recipe for success necessarily. It's just something that, that is to be done Yeah, because there's so many people learn so differently. There's no one template for learning jazz or teaching it for that matter. So in the meantime, while students are essentially figuring out how to teach themselves, we show them all these different avenues. They're sort of entry points. If you think of like the center of being like your own way of learning, you're trying to get into that. And, and it may not, you may not come into that. And that's that, that central way of learning in the way that you're being taught. And so, or you, you may, you may grasp certain concepts and others are lost or not, 
are not are not reaching you. And so so the students what are what they again we come back to the students where it's their responsibility, hopefully to figure out how they learn. Yeah. And then you work on uh, how to learn in a in a more uh, joyful and interesting way because you the, the the thing that gets you know if if it's it becomes sterile we want to figure out how to make this interesting and, and then keep coming back to the idea that this is really cool yeah and, is it this like you know yeah and i what i really enjoy about like just listening to you is you're almost describing it as if as if it's this process of discovery. Like you as the teacher don't even necessarily know the best way. You know a way to get started that has mm-hmm. maybe worked for m- multiple people, but you're almost using that. I think very similarly now where you're almost using like this way to get started as a way to say, is this the ba- way you best learn? If mm-hmm. so, great. We like yeah. <laughs> supercharge it. If not... We'll try something different, but like a, you're turning practice into a process of discovery. And I think musically that can be really exciting, but I also think even technically in the development of your skills, yeah. thinking about it as like, what problems can I find and how can I learn to solve them can turn practice from this drudgery of like finding all the things you suck at and then being like, I yeah. suck to like, all right, I found something that I can improve upon. How do I go about right. doing yeah. that? And um, one of the things you mentioned, and it's interesting you would use this this analogy talking about learning orchestral excerpts versus maybe even solos or jazz standards, is there is like a kind of way that orchestral things go, especially now. There's maybe less p- overall personality in orchestral music, mm-hmm. and the technical limit has gone way, way, way up, but things as recordings have come out and people are going all over the world from, from different, you know, schools and things, things have maybe become a little bit more homogenized. Right. Yep. And so yep. when you're listening to recordings, you're sort of trying to say, how do I fit into this way? But when you listen to 10 different standards, you're going to hear potentially 10 wildly different ways of doing it. Yeah. And so my question for you is, I also agree with you that using the masters to begin to develop some understanding of language is useful. What is it just time doing that, that you will eventually sort of through osmosis, find what you like, find what you don't like and develop your own style? Or is there a, a way at some point that you begin to wean yourself off of listening to the masters and begin challenging your own way of doing things? Well, as a, as a teacher, I'd like to see that happen for each student. So in the time that we have in four years or two years for a master's student, it would be great if we were able to get to the point where it's time to wean yourself off. Or, But there's so much to <laughs> process that a lot of times that part isn't even addressed. I mean, I try to, before students graduate, you know, leading in their last year, I try to sit down with them and say, okay, now here, we spent all this time kind of looking backwards and looking at, at these models. Um one of the, you know, there are stylists and there are innovators and some people, uh, you know, are, and, you know, it's great being a stylist. If you're known and respected and people love the way that you play or that you like the way you play and you're a stylist, you haven't come up with something new. Uh, that's not part of the, that's not part of the, uh, the recipe for everybody. But on the off chance, I do have some, some really, really bright students that are, uh, that are creative and that are sort of fi- trying to find their way. And we start talking about, well, you know, what would that look like if you were to start to develop your own vocabulary, your own language, and not your own, but your own take on the language that's out there and an extension or growth, which would push the music forward. And, and we look at ways uh, of compositionally and, and improvisationally pushing, pushing the music forward and what that might, we tr- what thinking about that might might look like and uh but it's usually a pretty brief discussion and it, it lasts a few weeks we go through some things and and i go they go out the door and they're gone you know mm-hmm. and so um you know it, it it's it's i wish there was a, a more tried and true way of that we know we can at least get them here what we do in my program is is we have a common body of repertoire that we all play so that um they know they have real clear expectations on, you know, you're going to go in for your board, you know, two years ahead of time, what you're going to go in for your board or what you're going to play. Yeah. Right. You don't have to think about it. We're all going to play it. No yeah. one's going to get off easy. Right. <laughs> and, and so, and, uh, you know, and, and just because you're really great doesn't mean you get a harder piece. And that was one of the things that I learned from Vince uh, DiMartino. I like the way he, he talked about it. He said, you know, in, in, in physics, he said, 
you know, everybody has the same homework. Everybody has, they uses the same book. They do the same things, at least in the, you know, the first couple of years of their, of their classes. And, and if someone's better at physics, we don't give them a harder book right. in that class. We still give them the same book. And if they get an A grade, but then we don't give them a harder book and then grade them harder. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I so, thought very simple. Um, like, like you think about a math class, it's like algebra, yeah. you learn these things, geometry, you learn these things, calculus, you learn these things, mm-hmm. and you ca- generally learn them in a certain order because they all build upon each other. Foundation, but I find yeah. in music, I mean, maybe some teachers have a curriculum that's that way, but as you said, there's no sort of standardized way of thinking about that. Like, there's a standardized mm-hmm. way that math does things and physics does things and all that kind of thing. Um, I think one challenge that I could imagine for someone who has spent time listening to recordings of the masters or, on, you know, on the classical idiom, just like, I'm going to play the canon, so I've listened to a bunch of people, and I'm going to try to copy what they're doing, making that shift into what do I think is just the idea that you might not have it figured out immediately. And you spoke to it already, saying maybe this becomes like a lifelong endeavor where it's not about figuring anything out, but rather we're just going to keep exploring. If someone finds themselves in that position where they're really struggling, saying like, it was easier when I was just copying people and I feel kind of lost... What would you say to that person or what kinds of encouragement would you give them um, to, to keep going and, and to still value this process, even if it's hard? Um, I, think, I think that's the, the point of it is, is that it, it's valuable because it's hard. You know, it's, it's, a lot of times we get into a, into a, a sort of a, a frame of reference where, like, you know, where, where the discussion is, you know, this is just a song. It's simple. You know, this, if you just do this, it'll be easy. It's, 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 it's really not supposed to be easy. We are trying to do something that, that can be really, really devil, devilishly difficult to do. And the, that's the point of it. And, and, and so the, the difficulties are things to be embraced and to be, to be overcome, but um, it's okay if it's difficult. It's supposed to be difficult. And it's really difficult because it's really cool. And it's really worth it. The difficulty is worth it if you're able to see past the difficulty. You have to have enough success to see past the difficulties and to know that you can have a certain amount of trust in, in, in the process of problem solving, of, of dealing with, with things that are that are you find difficult. And so, but it's okay for that, you know, and 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 if it's it can be simplified. We're always trying to simplify things. And when it becomes simple, um, that's a mark of growth. But at certain times, things are horribly complicated. And that's not just music. That's that's a lot of different things that we would do in life. So we're trying to boil things down to their, essent- their essentials. We're trying to be able to do larger things that take care of the smaller thing. You know, do one large thing that takes care of all of it. So the project that I'm doing with the, with Don Lee by playing it all in 12 keys and doing it for an hour a day instead of five minutes is that I'm I'm using that structure to deal with a hundred other things from transposition to range to articulation to technical uh, to virtuosity to ear training to so so like taking a process that instead of breaking it down to it into its individual bits finding a way to synthesize it musically that's where the repertoire comes in mm-hmm. the repertoire does that for us the repertoire tells you what you need to work on it exposes it for you so if you take on repertoire and i think that's also why sergey and al Vizzuti can play the way that they did because they they not because they sat around and played exercises but they you know sergey nikiriakov basically just sat around trying to play a violin concerto that's why he can play a violin concerto sure sure not because he did exercises he didn't do clar- i mean foundationally he had the chops to at least attempt it but so you're you're you know you're sort of like pushing things up to higher levels of learning instead of which is you know you've got this sort of polarity because everything is is co- contradiction and polarity so we want to we have big musical overarching missions and, and ideas things that are governing everything but then we also have minute detail work so for instance i was talking to some students the other day i had a one of my students last year just won the marine marine band mm-hmm. brent yeah. uh brent and so brent um brent worked with michael mergan who is our classical uh professor here at, at ccm and who was in the marine band and i know he said with him on the audition material quite a bit. Now, we only did a couple of sessions in my lessons with him. 
which is where he came in and played stuff that was already prepared. Now, Brent is a natural fast study. Um, so we were working, he played uh, Summon the Heroes for me, the solo on Summon some, some the Heroes, which is pretty, <laughs> pretty difficult, right? Uh, so he played the passage. And I just asked him, I said, well, what did you, what did you hear? What did you think? You know, that's, what did you notice? And he went, uh, the low, the low E was, uh, was, was flat or sharp or whatever it was, you know, I said, okay, can you fix that? And he's like, yeah, I think I can. And he played it again and he fixed it. And so now personally, it would have, ta- it would have taken me much more time to, to, to do that. But the thing that he, the reason that he's able to uh, be successful and win an audition like that is because he's able to be aware and operate in a, a really highly detailed way, yeah. uh, musical way. And so we get back to things that you were talking about in, in your, in your, uh, career as an orca- orchestral player and his career as a, as a bandsman with a, which is essentially an orchestral level band. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Right. So, so the, the, the detail work, is is very very fine and to be able to do that you have to have that focus you have to have that 100 percent focus and listening and awareness so it's not that i want to not have that but i don't want to have to access that for you know when i'm playing music you know in the community or when i'm playing concerts or whatever i want to have fun at this point i want it to not be so hard so i've got a certain amount amount of old man vibe going on in me in terms of the way that i'm I'm going at this it's like well you know i i for my my doctoral uh uh, uh recitals i i played as you know i played chains and uh scherzo uh scherzo and d what minor is at the what's the mendelssohn the, right no no the uh the mendez oh, i was thinking i know he did a mendelssohn okay. violin concerto so that's what i was thinking yeah. of. could be wrong though yeah, and I and I like I, I subcontracted out a small orchestra for the Jolive, and I did the, all this stuff. You know, I mean, like I I tried to play stuff that was as hard as I could because I thought there was a lot of value in playing challenging rep- repertoire. But man, it was it was hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, you know, at, you know, I'm looking at it as sort of the arc of the career at, at a certain point where it's like, okay, everything I do doesn't need to be hard. Yeah. How do I make that? How do I make it so it's it's enjoyable? You know. Yeah. And you know, that's that's kind of zooming out and seeing look what experiences that you like to have and uh, what you want music making to be, what that should feel like, and and how it should. You know, I want to I want to leave my house. Whatever I'm going to do musically, I want to look forward to it as much as possible. Yeah, I would make an argument that all of those hard things that you did probably led to a level of skill development where now at this stage, <laughs> yeah. like you're just yeah. like, I've done those things and I got out of it what I wanted. And maybe you're seeing the like sort of the risk reward. Like, is that what yeah. I want to be doing with my time? That's how I feel. Like, I know I have levels sure. of growth left, but I've developed enough skill where I'm really at this point of like, am I willing to do what I need to do? to continue driving into different levels. And it's not about like yeah. thinking I can or can't. It's like, is that what I want to do with my time at this point? And I don't know the answer personally, but um, the last thing I would like to dig into, and um, <laughs> I don't, I'm <laughs> very curious to see what you're going to say, because this Uh-oh. whole entire interview has given me a little bit of an insight into, I think what I, what to expect when I ask this question. But when we run into technical issues, which will happen for more developed players, maybe less often for less developed players, you know, people in school when they're playing their juries or they're playing in band and there's some crazy thing or the high note is too hard for them, whatever. Um, are there sort of tried and true methods of breaking music down that you find yourself going to, whether it's like slow playing or slurring everything or playing it softly? Or are there things that you would almost you'll go to first as a way to sort of filter out okay these are things that i don't need to work on these are things that i need to spend my time working on and how do you manage that because i think that you know i i generally recommend to people that if you're going to play petrushka to not work on articulation through petrushka because of all the baggage you're going to get on the way to developing your articulation so that when you develop it through things like arbin or getchel or top tones depending on your skill level then when you apply it to petrushka you're just working on the musical aspects and so it's sort of like a, my take yeah. is working on those fundamental things in fundamental types of exercises and then applying it to music. But you still sometimes need to like 
work out the technical things within an excerpt like Scheherazade, Petrushka, Tomasi, all that type of stuff. So I think what I'm asking with all of that context, what I'm asking is like, let's say you're playing Petrushka or something similar and you find yourself with uneven articulation or you don't know the notes or things like that. Do you have tried and true ways of breaking down the music, individualizing, working out the issues and then putting it back together? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I definitely have, have a way that I feel is, is effective for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, there, there are two parts to it. Um, at least two parts to it. One of them is, is whatever I'm looking, working on physically, musically, I don't want to be looking at it. All right. So I find what I'm trying to do is develop a relationship of the ear and the body. Um, so the, the process of looking at music while i'm trying to do that i find gets in the way for me so uh and there's there are studies about like the optic nerve occupying some large percentage of brain activity when it's being engaged Hmm. so so like anything that i'm going to do i'm going to look at i'm going to memorize the the notes and not the rhythms necessarily i mean the rhythms are probably going to be fairly straightforward if you're working in a small enough uh, right. point, but, the, but, but I'm going to get a, a, what I'm working on is shapes, skeletons. So everything is a skeleton. And I'm, uh, as you were alluding to, I take everything out, but the notes. Okay. I take the tempo out. I take the rhythm out. I take the volume out. I just, I'll take the articulation out and, um, I connect every note in a line with the next note. And basically what I'm looking at is navigation how to get, where's the distance from here to here to there, there. I want to navigate the physical musical line softly slurred. And that's, that's the biggest thing that I do. I find it to be extremely helpful, whether I'm playing merengue or I'm playing, you know, uh, you know, I, like, so for instance, with Tomasi, I don't know what's the right key, but um, I would just, uh, I, I slur those intervals. Or you know whatever I'm, I don't want to. I haven't. I sold my C trumpet nine years ago, so I, I, I don't. I don't want to. You're doing <laughs> great. Ten years ago, <laughs> yeah. In any case, I want to find position. The and what I'm trying to do with a musical line is compress the distance between the lower lower parts and the higher parts, so that it feels like it's here. Um, I may do this by I, I do this by taking up a volume and doing multiple repetitions softly in a way that allows me not to cr- crash my chops. Mm-hmm. So I, I do enough of that type of practice and I have enough of that foundational chops that I can do. And I'll set timers to make sure that I'm doing it. You know, I'm, I'm taking out the intensity. Uh, the thing that, that, that I think most people do when they're practicing is with volume, they, they run out of chops. And I think the most expensive thing that you have in terms of what, uh, what I call uh, facial units, FUs, <laughs> FUs. Okay, facial units. What's the what? You know, if I get if I play a high A, it's going to cost me ten facial units, right. FUs, right, or whatever like that. Um, but but hammering Tomasi, which is one of the things I did on my one of my on my master's recital, I used to sit there and just hammer it, just sort of thinking, okay, I'm just going to play it again and again. I did it so much that I met another graduate assistant, a friend of mine, two years after I graduated on a gig in a different city and he walked in the gig and he saw me and went, oh my you know, gosh. he heard me because I would be in that studio in my, gra- in my office at, at grad school, just hammering Tomasi. Um, and I know that was inefficient because I couldn't play it three years later. Sure. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? I had to like <laughs> relearn it. I didn't, it wasn't working. So, so, so like, that's like sort of like you're, you know, it's working if you can do it and then you come back and remember so you're again, you're using the notes to, to figure out the trumpet. It's telling you how what you need to do to get to each place. We add in add in the articulations after that, but I'm still gonna. It's just gonna be articulations and notes, um, not rhythms and not volume and not tempo. You know, so I'm going for ease of production, not hurting my chops, being able to do multiple repetitions, um, take specified rests. So the rests are going to be three minutes, two minutes. If it's really, if it's in the upper register, I'm going to take a three minute rest, especially if my chops feel good. 
especially yeah you don't want to overdo it just because yeah. it feels good yeah. so that you mm-hmm. tomorrow feels yeah. good and the yep. next yeah totally yeah. totally and so i think it's really easy to it's really easy to say well i'm gonna roast as much as i play because my chops hurt it's when you're it you know what we run into problems is if you when your chops feel good and you're like oh i don't need the rest yeah, that's exactly when you need the rest right right you know so like i, I sort of say that you know in my books i say you know rest before you need it and i mainly mean that so that you're you're, you're conserving your chops you know, in, in a way with intensity and demanding stuff. So, so, uh, and I'm throwing my hands around a lot. Of this, uh, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm maybe going to be on the next episode of The Sopranos. Um, <laughs> but in any case, the the idea that I, I'm trying to make a musical line easier to produce, yeah, yeah. and to do that, I'm going to. I know that the the way my markers for that are going to be the notes feel closer together. Mm-hmm. All right. And I'm also feeling in my body. I'm I'm listen, I'm feeling back to make sure I'm not feeling any kind of pushes or pulls or moments where I'm I'm leaning in or adding compression or in the moment, so that I'm keeping my body physically quiet. Mm-hmm. My body is physically quiet. So if I'm, I'm in the upper register, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, you know, you can see a lot of times with students, you can see them miss notes. Sure, sure. You know. You know Da, 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 da. you know the body's going to move and and so what what that's telling you is is when you see that and feel it it's telling you that the conditions for that note aren't present in your body and you're trying to add them at the last minute yeah and so it sounds like you're you're breaking it down to what component you would consider to be the thing that is sort of baseline which would be ease mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. that it's all easy and then you're going to start adding other variables back in while trying to keep that ease is my assumption yeah, yeah, and it's like it's not it's not like super easy. It's just not like I'm not right, uh, right. You know, it's it's just the balance. There's a lot of energy going on. There's positive tension. There's there's focus, physical focus, and there's energy that's happening. It's stored in my body in terms of hopefully in, ter- in terms of potential energy. Yeah. So it's ready to go with the com- the, the pressurized compressed air, however you want to think of it. So that i'm releasing air i'm always thinking about releasing air as opposed to blowing it that's yeah, something totally. i think is really helpful you know but the, the the idea that if i can do these small can, another vince di martinoism is you know you can what do you say you can slur without tonguing but you can't tongue without slurring mm, yeah so so everything is slur air yeah you know even with rests so even with rest if you have like uh say like upbeats you know do bop ah 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 where you go, do da da, but my body is still. Yeah, totally. So I'm thinking a phrase. I'm looking at ways of phrasing over rests and and things like that of making connections in the line. But it starts with navigation. How a lot of times I have a, a, a theory on where notes where you miss notes. I have a, it's called a creeper note. My creeper note theory. The creeper note is the note where things start to go wrong, but they you don't miss it. Mm-hmm. It's the first note that's out of position. Like a lot of times, it's coming down. So, that the note coming down after the high note. That's where things we tend to jump down too far for mm-hmm. those notes, even if we hit it. So, so conceptually and physically, I want that top note. You know, which is misty, by the way. It's the, the top part of Tomasi is misty. Look at me. <laughs> do, 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 do. Anyway, um, but the you know so so the where is that? And I'm trying to recall how to get through the line, the the navigation of it, as opposed to where to put notes. I'm never trying to think about where to put notes. Hmm. I want to recall recall where they are. Yeah, how to get to them. Yeah, I, I come back to. Them. I, I feel. I mean, I'm. <laughs> it's not just confirmation bias for me, but I feel that. I try to talk about it very similarly in terms of you want to break something down to like where you're playing it the way you want to in terms of production mm-hmm. and then build it back up as opposed to just hammering away and assuming someday it's just magically going to work. Yeah. Cause yeah, I just yeah. feel like if that actually worked, everybody would be amazing at the trumpet, right? Because we wouldn't ever have to think about how to actually practice if just sheer repetition at tempo in all the regular conditions right. would make everybody better. And so now one thing, one thing I do do that is maybe a little, I don't want to say it's counterintuitive, but it is, um, it's different than I was taught or that I understood. And, and this is the idea of learning 
technical passages. We're going to say we're going to take range out of it, something that's maybe not in the upper register where I have to kind of get jump. I, I, you know, we're talking about Tomasi. We're talking about things that are angular, mm-hmm. and that's the most for me. I th- I think it's the most difficult thing to do on on a brass instrument is angularity, especially in the upper register. But if it's something that um, like say well the so- is that a saxa the back page of the one of the brand it's a brand, it's a brand. Sorry. Sorry. piece number one brand. yeah yeah so so like that um I, I i am not a proponent in my own practice of slowing things down far slower than i can play them mm-hmm. so in other words i think a lot of times when people are are slowing things down they slow them down actually too much so that um because they're moving so slowly, then you get an unrealistic expectation of how perfect they are, they are or aren't, mm-hmm. right? So in other words, so for me, I will actually take something that's as close to tempo as I can get it, if it's a, it's a technical passage, and do my reps at a faster tempo, even if they're not clean, and try to clean the reps up at a closer to tempo tempo if that makes sense yep. so 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 i'm not trying to play perfect 10 times at 50 when my goal tempo is you know 160 sure sure and i can kind of play it sloppily at 120 i'm not going to go all that way back sure sure because then it's like it, it, it becomes like a dirge it, it's not the same it's really not the same thing i don't think so i mean i want to know where the notes are so i will i like to have i like to clean things up sort of at a at the fastest possible tempo yeah that makes sense you know you said you had two two th- two aspects of what we could call your method the first was you don't want to be looking at the music you want to try to internalize it like yeah. as like you're hearing this and you're just like following where your ear is hearing what would the second thing be if you can re- recall well, the second thing is 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 that that idea that you're trying to to is the synthesis of the feet, body feel with the sound that you're trying oh, to produce, okay. right. so that you have a good you know it's that that's where I'm getting at when I go down to those skeletons. Sure, sure. You know those basically this everything is slurred and connected by by way of air. So, um, but it's it's an, it's a musical endeavor. I'm not looking at it. Yeah. You know, and the repetitions are refined. It's refining repetitions. The repetition has to get better as opposed to just the same, you know, the same thing that you're doing it. Um, you know, and, and, um, you know, I'm trying to think, Yeah, no, I, I had taken some notes of, Oh, I did want to, I wanted to say one thing about your, the, the, that, that came down to this, you know, we were talking about like detail work, you know, when you're, when you're working on a piece of music for detail work, um, we sometimes think in terms of mistakes, um, and a mistake there, I think there are, you know, there are different ways of framing things that don't go as according to plan. And so like there are errors where you literally miss the note or there's a chip or there's something that's audible. And then there are, um, I would say there, I, I would call them errors of intention. And an error of intention is something where you're trying to, to do something musically and it doesn't come off. It, it's not, it's not effective. You're not able to actually do it. But the audience doesn't know you're trying to do it. Maybe. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I'm talking yeah, about? Those errors so happen you, you, all the time. Yes, yes. So, so like the, um, and like really high level players are super, they tend to be very aware of that part of, of the, the detail work. So, for instance, when Sergey was here, when I was a student, this is almost 20 years ago, um, he gave a master class and he, he played something and, it was beautiful. And to everybody in the room, it was just perfect. And as he was describing the process, and it, you know, he, he just said, you know, for instance, in this, in this phrase, I made seven errors, <laughs> you know, and, and, and the whole room is kind of going, what? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't hear anything. Um, you know, so there's like this, and, and which means that, you know, he had intentions to do things in a certain way and they didn't come out the way that he was intending them. And he was so deep in the, uh, you know, in the detail of it that to him, they were just almost distracting. Right. But to the audience, you know, they had no idea. So, so that's what we're striving for is to get to that point where you're, where you're the things that you're 
you know, the details of what you're doing are inaudible to the audience, yeah. you know, where, you know, you're, maybe you're playing, we're back to that set studio session and maybe I'm playing third trumpet and on a passage, you know, where's a big 2d section at the end, maybe I chip a couple of notes that are on the take, but I'm not going to sit there and go, Oh uh, yeah. On the end of two, the eighth note, uh, you know, at the end, it's just like, it was the idea of what was necessary for the gig. They're not going to, it's not going to be audible. Yeah. It's an inaudible mistake. And, and so the awareness can come all the way down to that thing where, where things are. And that's something that improvisers deal with a lot because they're going, they think they're hearing things. They're trying to play them Mm -hmm. and what comes out sounds okay, but that wasn't what they were trying to play necessarily. Yeah. I played the Gregson trumpet concerto here. Um, and it was a Mm -hmm. Friday and a Saturday night and Saturday night, I felt like went as good as I could have hoped for. It wasn't perfect, but I think if I did it again, I would have exchanged some, some things that went better for other things that I would have made mistakes on. But the Friday night Mm -hmm. performance, I felt like it wasn't, I wasn't quite as quote in the zone. I memorized it. So I was there, but I, you know, I was a little nervous. It's an uncomfortable situation. I'm not normally in front of the orchestra. And when I walked off, I would say, I'm satisfied, but I'm not sure I'm happy, right? Like, I'm satisfied. Mm-hmm. The work was good. But people came up to me, and they were just like, wow, like, your sound is yeah. this. Or, like, I thought you nailed it. And I was talking to my son, who plays violin, and he's really hard on himself. And I was like, you know, did you think that it was a good performance? He's like, yeah, I guess, you know. And then, <laughs> yeah, and then I was like, well, I made a lot of mistakes Whatever. in that. And he's like, I had no idea, right? And it's like... I think actually managing that is really important because like if the audience is happy in my mind, we did our job. And if we have things that we want to continue improving upon, that is a wonderful and very good thing. But to assume that the whole thing was wrecked because you yeah. made, it's like a, almost like too self-centered of a way of seeing music in yeah. my opinion. Um, well, you know, the, the, you're, you're trying to get a baseline of, you know, and, and, and one of the, one of the drags about all of this, all the stuff that we're talking about is, is, you know, when you were talking about a student who's hitting difficulties, there are a couple of things that are sort of paradoxical about, about the learning process. One of them is, um, we're not even paradoxical, but, but disappointing is that when we, we face something that we're struggling with, we don't always get like some big moment where we're no longer struggling with it where we notice it it's it's such a grad it can be such a gradual kind of process and plateau that it's often at least in my experience more like you realize oh i used to struggle with that and it's a lot easier for me to do now or that's not something i'm worried about but i used to worry about it all the time Mm -hmm. and and so because of that it's it's we don't have that validation all the time that we're that we've achieved something that we're past it we don't even recognize we're past something as the years go by it's like oh that was a thing that was you know that i always you know and there's some some things that we still so struggle with 40 years later um but it was it's funny my I, I told you my wife is a really wonderful french horn player she's got great ears and i was playing a gig this was years ago I was playing lead and she was at it and she's the person that knows my playing better than anybody else on the planet. She's heard me play a million, a million shows and gigs and everything like that. And I was playing lead on whatever this, this show was, um, it was, it was a big band, something. And I thought I sounded really great. You know, I was like, yeah, I'm, I was digging me, mm-hmm. you know, and yeah. I thought I, I'm just, you know, just whatever, laying it down. And, and I was pretty proud of myself. And so after the gig, I, I was, I don't do this a lot, but I, with her, I was like, you know, I was kind of like trolling for compliments and, and I'm like, well, you know, what, you know, what'd you think? You know, <laughs> so you, you sounded good, you know? And I'm like, I mean, did I sound good or you know, did I sound, <laughs> you know, good, you know? And, uh, she's like, oh, you sound like you normally sound. And I was like, ah, oh, you know, you know, this is kind of like, I thought I was sounding like amazing. Right. Right. And then, uh, you know, maybe later the next, uh, next day or something like that, I was like, wait a minute, hang on a second. That's like absolutely the best possible thing to say, because like, I thought on my best day that my best day was much more noticeable than mm. what I normally sound like. I see. So, so what you're striving for isn't that, you know, you're going to have these amazing days where everyone's like, Whoa, you know, you sound so much and you're going to have those hopefully too. 
Um, but like that, your baseline becomes your consistency becomes such that, and that hopefully the converse is true as well, that, that your worst day is also just, you kind of sound like you. Right. And, and it really actually works out that way is that after, after you get the basic consistency things going on of fundamental practice and, and your chops together, at least at a professional level for most people around you, a good day is not really distinguishable from a, a mediocre to a bad day. We feel it like, like the stock market is dropping, you know, like the <laughs> bottom drops out and nobody else is even noticing because they're not even, they're not thinking about us. So, you know, that's, that's something to bear in mind when you're, when you're looking at, at what the struggling process is going to be like, what it's really good, a realistic way of what it's going to look like when you get to the other side of some of these things is just like, you just don't think about them anymore. You don't have some, you know, ticker tape parade with, you know, confetti and everything like that, that is like, Oh, you don't, you, you got to high G now, you know? <laughs> right. Like that. Yeah. So I think that's a great perspective because I remember asking my undergrad teacher, Michael Anderson, I know you know him. He, <laughs> yeah, I was just like, asking him like, does Phil Smith have bad dates? You know, wanting this validation of like mm-hmm. everybody. And he's like, yeah, but nobody knows it. You know, and I thought that that kind of stuck with me as like, well, that may be the goal is not to not have bad days, but to make it so other people may not notice your bad days. And that's a yeah. that's a different goal. If you don't mind, what I would like to try to do is I'd like to try to summarize some of what we talked about. I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to talk for a little while here and just try to All make right, sure cool. that we we that we can walk away. I mean, this has been a great conversation and I'm just going to try to cover it here at the end so we can uh, and make sure that I, I picked it up right. You can fill in any gaps. Um, and we talked about two different sort of approaches when you're talking about uh, process. One process is going to be maybe you sit down on a gig and you're already thinking about how am I, especially if it's a, a gig where you are reading something and you will be recording it 15 or 30 minutes later, like, what do you do to make sure you're going to be ready to do that? For me, the equivalent might be you know, I have a week or two weeks with some music and how am I going to break this down? But it's not going to be the same thing as learning a full concerto or something like that. Right. And so what you would maybe do in that situation is you're a, a, at the beginning, you're looking for a basic roadmap. And so you're looking through and maybe this is something you can do depend no matter what piece is like, OK, what is here? What's the key signature? Are there meter changes? You're just looking to see, are there any pitfalls so that you understand the basic form of the piece? And then you're like you were, the other thing you were talking about was just looking at for anything that look difficult. There are certainly probably things that you find out are more difficult than they appear to be, mm-hmm. but you're doing your best to find those. And then maybe you are going to start to wrap your brain around, are there any patterns that I can find? So it's not just what are these notes, but rather, oh, that's G sharp diminished. Boom. Now my fingers know where to go to make yeah. that process of uh, absorbing it a little bit more um uh, faster, I guess. You were saying that that it's like this kind of work is very rewarding, but it's also stressful because it really puts your skills to the test. And like ultimately, you're you want it to be artistic, you want it to be stylistic, but you're not necessarily thinking I'm putting my stamp on this. You're you're keeping in mind the scope and the perspective of this is to really just lay down something that's going to be stylistically uh, accurate, that's going to be musical, enjoyable to listen to, but you're not necessarily redefining the whole genre. You're just trying to do a good job. Um, And so uh, that would be that one. And then when we talked about um, the other side of it and we use the transcription, um, or we used me learning uh, a piece of music you described. Really, what you first want to do is just develop a relationship with the piece separate from the music. You want to try to play along with the recording, see how much you can copy just in terms of style. And then once you have a general, the general gist of the piece, you might start start digging into what are they doing? Why are they doing it? How does that function harmonically? Where you start to really get detailed into the piece. And... Um, I would jump in with just the idea that mm-hmm. that's done after lots of listening to the piece. So, so we, we okay. listen to it over and over again, put the thing on your, you know, listen to it on your, you know, your earphones while you're walking to class, while you're sitting around, just, you know, multiple, multiple listening, you know, you can jump in and start playing along, but, but really you want to know what's going to happen and you, you'd be able to hum along or sing along with it yeah. before you pick your horn up. Yeah. Yeah. So it's almost like this, osmosis thing first you're not trying to yeah. figure it out you're just trying to develop a relationship with it yeah, yeah. Um, i wrote here too what you wrote when you have it 
oh, we have it memorized. You look at, then you're looking at solos, the analysis, the language, common patterns, and then you're just trying to understand how how the, all this fits together. Um, and then for for in terms of detail work, what you talked about was whatever it is, you're also trying to get yourself off of the page as much as possible. My assumption is just to test how how much of it is a part of you. Can I play through this? Where are the gaps and how much I can remember so that the first step is really trying to internalize it to some degree. And you'll do that by removing many variables yeah. and just focusing on the notes, making sure you have a relationship with, you know, trying to get these high notes to feel more like low notes, low notes to feel more like high notes. So everything feels like it's sort of in this easy sort of middle ground, if you want to call it that. Yeah. And then you'll start adding other types of variables like rhythm, articulation, dynamics, things like that, so that you're building this thing up from, and mostly I'm assuming this is just very technical stuff. It's not, you're not going to do this to every single measure of music. Sure. It's just yeah. these yeah. things that you're having a hard time. And so it seems like for you, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but so much of your practice is just guided by what does my ear not understand and how do I get my ear to understand that? That and, and what, what does it feel like to play that? What does it feel like to play this right? It's like, like, uh, there's so many sports now. What's it feel like to shoot a, shoot a foul shot? Mm-hmm. You know, that's what you're, you know, a basketball player, you just scored 50 points. Well, I was really feeling it tonight. Well, you're feeling what that release is like. You're feeling like where that, where those notes are in relation to each other. And, and it's not, it's not about, uh, I think there's a misconception about feel with it being not how your lips feel, Yeah. but just the, I, I think all good players are, are feel player, are good feel players. They just know where, the, where stuff is and and they're able to get to it as and i think in terms of navigation yeah you know i wrote that in capital letters over here in navigation because it seemed like that's a different way of describing it than what you were saying is like what is this note where does it go so much as like i it's like a gps almost right mm-hmm. like you understand yeah, just, like yeah. there's a you know how to get from place to place you're using your gps at first but eventually you learn it by heart and you don't have to pay attention so strictly to the GPS. Another thing you said, and I think it's worth mentioning, is that a lot of these processes are ours to actively engage with. It's not something that someone gives to us. They can make suggestions on how to get started. But really, to get to a high level of mastery, you need to be able to engage with this yourself and start asking questions and search for it yourself. Uh, Because, yeah, like you were saying, almost like it required, it will just require a lot of hours of this exploration. It's, you know, you can have a great teacher that suggests great things, but for you to own this information, it's not something that someone will just say, do this and you have it all figured out. And rather, instead of seeing it as figuring it out, it's sort of this lifelong, I'm just going to have a relationship with this and do things that are interesting to me and enjoy just in almost like enjoy playing while also trying more challenging things over time. Yeah. I mean, some of, some of the things that you play are, are foundational. Some of them are, there's the, there's stuff that you do that everybody does. We all do Clark two and Clark three and Clark and whatever like that. But then the people that really get good are, are people that do things that other people don't do. You know, what, what, what is everybody else doing? And I can do that a little bit you know, you look at someone like Jerry Hay, who, you know, where he's doing, he's doing, started out doing things that were given to him, uh, you know, by his teacher, Bill Adam. Um, and one of the things that he said is, is like, well, you know, Mr. Adam gave us this, you know, this stuff to do. And then we figured out what to do with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, I heard him say that in an interview. And that, that means it's like, okay, here's what everybody does. Do this stuff. And then he was like, well, okay, that's what everybody does. What can I do with it? All mm-hmm. right. You know, and that's where you're, you're, you're taking ownership of the process. Yeah. Well, I appreciate all of this information and I appreciate your time. Um, is there anything that, that we did not cover that you want to sort of tack on the end here just to make sure that um, there's something you wanted to talk about, but we didn't get to it? Yeah, I mean, I've just come back to the thing, the idea that some of the things that you're going to play, hopefully, are, are things you're going to play, the, that idea of repertoire for life. And I think that's nice about being a jazz musician is we're going to play the same tunes forever. So there's no, it's not disposable. So sometimes... I think the the culture that we have with where you're taking a lesson every week and you check that off and you never play it again, you know, and, and it's like you, you keep doing, there's more stuff to play. There's more things to break down. There's more as the idea is like learning, learning songs, learning a concerto, learning a, a solo that you're going to hang on to for a, a while and that you are going to embrace over a long period of time. 
and uh, you know that you can enjoy and look at. It might be something in the Arvin book. It might be some some etudes, but like finding a way into music where it's not just the, the stuff I'm on some timeline that I have to learn by next Thursday, because that's a, just that's a different. When the minute you've got that hard timeline, that's what gives you the motivation, the short term motivation to do it. But the the long term motivation should be your love of music, I hope, mm-hmm. and making it making it interesting. So playing yeah. melodies, playing you know things that are you know you want to you want to do, and then writing your own music, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Well, again, I appreciate it. If someone's heard this and they said this guy sounds sarcastically funny, and I want to talk to him, how would uh, how would somebody get a hold of you uh, if they wanted to um, chat or say thanks for the episode? Well, I'm on Facebook. Just my name, Scott Belk. Uh, I've got uh, and scottbelk dot dot com. It's my website, and uh, I have a blog that I I tend to seldom, but it's it's got some some of my writing there. It's trumpetshed dot com, and I'm at the University of Cincinnati, and I direct a jazz program. So if uh, if uh, if you've sat through all of this. Why would you want to come to San? No, I'm just. Saying, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can find me through through the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music CCM website, um, CCM Jazz Studies. Awesome. Yeah. So again, thank you, um, and I, I want to quickly thank Brandon Yoakum for his work on mastering this episode. You can check Brandon out at epiphanyrecordingstudio.com. And most of all, I would like to thank you for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. We will see you in the next one. <laughs>